will be spending quite a bit of time looking at the words of Luke, and today we begin thinking about this author by the name of Luke. I'd like for you to consider for a moment that thankfulness and appreciation is a muscle. And there's a few things that you and I know about muscles. Uh, a muscle has a purpose, and the great thing is, is when it is used and when it is exercised and, and when it's uh, being full of all sorts of activity, well, well great things happen in all sorts of things can take place when muscles are well-developed. And somebody who exercises and takes care of their muscles uh, feels like they could do just about anything. But you and I know that the opposite is also true. A muscle that isn't used, no one bothers to stimulate, well, it can atrophy. And the contrast between the two <laughs> is absolutely dramatic. We have a lifestyle today in which it's a little bit more of a challenge to use probably a dozen or two of our muscles. Because the car is so convenient and the push buttons, they automate everything. And so you and I, we end up sitting more than doing. And we might get into that lifestyle until one day a doctor looks us in the eye and says, are you sure you want where this is going? Because it's not going to be very healthy. Muscles are there to be used. If we consider thankfulness and appreciation as a muscle, that's something that's also there to be used. And when we use thankfulness and appreciation, it's amazing what that does to the health of our soul, the perspective that we have. Our thoughts change when we are thankful. Now, uh, earlier it was mentioned that Sherry and I are coming from a place that's a long way away from here, seven time zones. But the greatest distinction between Romania and Eastern Europe and here is, is not the time zone change, it's, it's other factors. So let me just share one with you. It's the factor of taxation. In Romania, if you have a moderate or low income, which would be a desperate straits in this country, given their economic status, your taxation classification for your income tax and social taxes is between 58 and 68 percent. Add on that a sales tax of 19 percent in Romania and 27 percent in Hungary, and you are talking about a completely different world of taxation. Now, what I believe is true is that probably no one walked into this room today with a thought on your mind, wow, I'm really thankful for our taxation system in this government. <laughs> probably every single one of us is like, can't they tone that thing down? Can't I keep more of my money? And we probably wouldn't say thank you at all. But the truth is, if you broaden your context, and if you realize what you have, we could actually be flexing that muscle of thankfulness, even when it comes to, to taxation, we could. But you see, uh, I grew up in the good old U.S. of A., and I was so unthankful for so many things because I didn't realize how special they were until I broadened my context and I realized, wow, didn't God give us something great here? And what's true is this, exercising the muscle of thankfulness, it is good for the soul and it changes our perspective. And the question that I have for myself and for you today is, how thankful are we that God has given us the scriptures and his word. Is that something that sort of captures us and we say, man, am I thankful for that? Because when God gave us his word, he gave us access to know the unknowable. And that is an absolute privilege. Now, across human history, we've defined what man has walked through based on ages. And uh, man, apparently, he passed through something called the Stone Age, and he plunge forward into the Iron Age, you skip a few ages, you get yourself to the Industrial Age, and all of a sudden you come to our age, and I think that we all know we've been told that we are living in the Information Age today. And what that means is we actually think and believe that information is powerful, it can change your life, it can open new opportunities, expand your horizons, and so we love information. And I just want you to know, for anyone living in the information age, I think that we should be more fascinated and more appreciative of God's revelation than any other generation. Because we are talking about how important information is, and the information that God has given us, it is the most blessed, profound information of all. God spoke through the prophet of Isaiah, and he said this. He said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. Now, he's going to qualify that statement in the next verse when he says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Let's take that one verse at a time. I think differently than you do. And we could hear that phrase and go, I'm not sure that that means it's a big deal because 
In this room today, we have people who think differently from each other. Have you not noticed? (laughs) You hear an opinion and you're like, man, I certainly don't agree with that. We all think differently from each other. And so we could say, maybe that's not such a big deal until Isaiah writes the next verse. And he wants to say, now let me qualify for you how, just how big that difference is. It is the difference between the earth and the heavens. Now this was written by a person who lived in an age and a generation in which no man had ever flew, no airplane had ever been created, no one took a jet airliner, no one conceived of hurling a projectile into orbit, and no one understood what escape velocity was. For Isaiah, the distinction between the earth and the heavens is something that could not be penetrated. That is how great the distinction is between God's thoughts and our thoughts. And how is it that we could know those thoughts? There is but one option that God would graciously choose to reveal them to us. No amount of research, no amount of intellectual advancement would ever take us to perceive and understand the mind of God. And does that not cause your muscles to flex in thankfulness that he would be so gracious as to reveal to us what is in his mind? Without his revelation, we would be lost, limited, and self-deceived, and no one wants to be there we would be lost. Let's break that down a little bit. We would be lost because spiritually we would not know what it is that we should do. We would be lost because we would be confused on the grand purpose of our lives. We would be lost in our sense of time, and you and I would let eternity slip through our fingers as we focused obsessively on something as small as one year or one decade. We would not only be lost, but we would be limited. Limited when we try to understand the divine. Have you heard people try to describe who and what God is? And have you been surprised at how weak and pallid those descriptions are? We would be limited, always trying to find our own utopia, but where do you go to find it? We don't create that very well. We would be limited in our imagination, thinking that if time was boundless and endless, that we would spend our lives in boredom. What a pathetic imagination is that. Only a person who is bored would have that thought. We would find ourselves self-deceived trying to create all the answers of the universe because no one provided any others. And when we do that, you see what happens. We put man at the center and we say we are the standard of all. What a low standard that is. But God did not leave us lost, he did not leave us deceived, and he did not leave us limited, he gave us his revelation. But that raises the question, doesn't it? For as his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and his ways are higher than our ways, if his mind is impenetrable, how in the world is that revelation going to make its way to us? And we need to ask the question, who's going to stand in that gap? And that brings us to the person who is going to be walking us through a series of studies, and his name is Luke. And God Almighty chose a man, and through his mind, his experience, and his quill, he would pour forth the revelation of God so that you and I could know the unknowable. When I think about this person, Luke, I I think that he fascinates us for multiple reasons, and I'd like to share just a few of them. We're fascinated by Luke because... This man wrote 28% of the entire New Testament. That's right, that's more than one in every four words poured through the pen of Luke. So in terms of divine revelation, he is an absolute heavy hitter who's going to teach us much about our Lord and Savior. This person, Luke, did something that Matthew, Mark, and John did not do. He wrote not one volume, but two. Now we pick up his name real easy in his first volume that we call the Gospel of Luke, in which he spells out for us the story of Jesus, and he starts from Jesus' birth till his death, resurrection, and ascension, and he says, there we go, that's a good picture, I'm winding it up here. After he writes the story of Jesus, he's not done, he says, I got to give you volume two, and we call that the book of Acts, he wrote it as well, the two fit together. Book of Acts, that's the story of the church. 
And Luke says, let me tell you about the church. I'm going to start with the beginning of the church, and I'm going to take you through the church as it progresses through Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And when he gets to the end of the earth, Luke says, I think you kind of got it now. I think you understand the church. And there is no one in all of history that tells us more about the church and what it should look like than, than Luke explaining how it was created and formed in his gospel. Which I think raises a question for you and me. Why in the world would God choose this person to do so much? Now, I don't think that Scripture gives a direct answer to that question, but it might give a hint. And where might that hint be? It might be in Luke as he tells us what was on his heart and his intention as he started to write. This was a man who was fully dedicated to research, accuracy, and clarity. And we're going to let Luke go ahead and explain that to us. Because as he begins to write the Gospel of Luke, these are the words that he starts with. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Those things are the life of Jesus. You'll see that in the context if you keep reading chapter 1. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account to you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that have been taught. You hear the theme? Luke is saying, guys, I'm going to work. I'm going to investigate. I'm going to research. I'm not going to give you any account. I'm going to give you an orderly account. And by the time I'm done writing, here's what you're going to have. You're going to have certainty. Certainty. That's what I promise you, says Luke. And so this man had a motivation, which I think is described well this way. Luke basically says, I am working hard to precisely present to you the life of Jesus, the most important person who ever lived. Do you not like Luke? Did we not need a person like Luke? And there's one other thing that fascinates us about the the book of Luke. It is this that Luke oftentimes is the only one who tells us something that we cherish. Luke is the only one who happened to say, oh, remember when Jesus was born? Well, you see, out there in the hillside of Judea, the angels appeared and they came singing only in Luke. If Luke hadn't written, you never would have a Christmas carol of Hark the Herald Angels Sing, or Angels You Have Heard on High. You didn't never hear that. If it wasn't for Luke... We wouldn't even have those wonderful words, and you will find this babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. We cherish those words. They they came from Luke's quill. Luke's the only one who tells us some stories. And every single time you hear somebody who calls somebody else a good Samaritan, where did that come from? Well, it certainly came from Jesus. He told the story. But who tells us the stories that Jesus told? Well, Luke's the only one who captures this story. And Jesus told that story to define what it means to be a good neighbor. And do we need to know what it means to be a good neighbor today? We do. Luke's the only one who tells us about a boy who's so rude that he asks to have all of his inheritance now and he leaves because he wants to disassociate himself from the family. He's the only one who tells the story of the father who accepts him, who runs, who brings him back. And as we read that story, we go, man, I know something about that boy. Sometimes I feel like him. Luke brought that message to us. Luke's the only one who tells us about a miracle when Jesus heals the ten lepers. And the fascinating thing is after all ten were healed, only one came back to say thank you. Oh, we're not the only ones that have that muscle atrophied when it comes to thankfulness and appreciation. We have nine people who got the gift they'd been asking for forever, and they couldn't even stop to say thank you. It tells us something about people. Luke tells us more about the life of Jesus as a child than any other author. He pops us into that moment when he's 12. He goes to the temple and all of a sudden this kid is teaching the greatest teachers of the nation. And when mom and dad show up, Jesus says this, But do you not know that I must be about my father's business? Ever hear a 12-year-old talk like that? Not typically, but Jesus is not a typical child. Luke's the one that tells us that after the feet of Jesus were washed by a woman who cared so much that she would wash his feet with her tears and her her hair, Luke uh, tells us a story because you see Simon who this happened in his home, he objected to this and Jesus said that's not right. 
Let me tell you a story, Simon, about two debtors. The point of the two debtors is that neither one of them could pay their debts. It covers everybody. Luke's the one who tells us that story. And Luke's the guy who tells us about that short little fella who ended up having a big story. Zacchaeus, whose life was changed when he bumped into Jesus. Are you starting to feel that the contribution that Luke makes has touched our lives, affected our culture, formed our thinking? We are indebted to Luke. And I want to suggest to you that it could be true that the words of Luke have brought more people into the kingdom of God than any other words ever written. And here's my case. You probably have heard of something which is called the Jesus film, the most translated film in the entire world. It's been seen by billions of people. All of the words in that film come from the Gospel of Luke. And there are millions and millions of people that met Jesus, not so much as they watched a movie, as they heard the words of Luke and saw the portrait of Jesus that he presented, and they said, that's all I need. I'm going to him. Now, if Luke's words are so important, we could ask ourselves the question, is it true that Luke has a big idea or a primary message? Because we'd hate to read through all 24 of the chapters and go, um, I'm not quite sure <laughs> what that is. We'd like to be able to say, I got it. Here's the, here's the big idea. And Luke does have a primary message. Most people who have studied it says, you got to go to chapter 19, verse 10. This is the center. This is the heart of what Luke wants to say. And, and in that verse, Jesus describing himself, says this. The Son of Man, a term he loved to use for himself, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Well, as Jesus defined what his work and ministry was, he says, that's what I'm doing. I'm seeking to save the lost. Now, the Gospel of Luke is the story of Jesus, and if this is the purpose of Jesus, then this must also be the primary purpose that we need to pick up in the Gospel of Luke. He came to seek and to save the lost. And the question needs to be asked, well, who then would the lost be? And we might be looking around and saying, I wonder who those folks might be. As we read Luke's gospel, he leaves no doubt. As his readers read what he wrote, we find ourselves identifying ourselves with the prodigal son, identifying ourselves with the disciples who didn't quite understand everything that Jesus said identifying ourselves that in the story of the two debtors, they both can't pay and neither can I. Luke talks about all of us being lost. And just to make sure that we didn't miss the point, Luke says, the theme's so important that I'm going to tell you a story about a lost coin, and then I'm going to tell you a story about a lost sheep. And then I'm going to tell you a story about a lost boy and a lost son. And all these stories I'm telling to a nation that's lost, that isn't following God the way that he asked, and then I'm going to let you know that the religious leaders who act like they know what's going on, they don't get it. They're lost too. And finally, he's going to introduce us to the short little guy named Zacchaeus before Jesus says these words. And this is how Luke writes about Zacchaeus. Then Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector in the metropolis of Jericho. You just hear that description? The chief tax collector. Now, the tax system was corrupt back then. And this guy was the ringleader of it all in this huge area. And when those words were written, everybody reading those words go, hey, man, that, that guy's lost. I, I, I know that guy's lost. Luke talks about people who are lost. We're all lost. It's Luke's message for us. And we need to be careful that we don't get used to being lost. Because that's not what God's plan is. To be lost is to feel like we're distant from God because our sins have separated us from him. To be lost is to be scarred by sin and feel like there's no healing that's ever going to come. To be lost is to look at the blackness of death and find that you have absolutely no hope and no alternative. That's lost. To be lost is to wish for a better life and to feel powerless that you can't find it. And Luke says, we all started there. And in the Gospel of Luke, there is no one who lifts himself up by his bootstraps. There is no one who is good enough on his own. There is no one who says, look at what I did. I'm probably okay. Not in the Gospel of Luke. 
everyone is lost and they need some help. I don't know if you've watched the news. I kind of like the news. And there's stories in the news. I bumped into this story just Friday. Maybe you did too. Uh, I bumped into the story of a, of a guy by the name of Nicholas. And Nicholas, he grew up in Fresno, and I guess this past week he decided he'd visit some friends over in Utah. And as he was uh, there, apparently he's in really good shape, and he's an outdoor kind of guy. And so he said, man, I'm going on an all-day hike all by myself. And he took off, and apparently the weather system is different in Utah than it is in Fresno. And so he left, and everything was looking good. But man, as that day went, something blew in fierce. And poor Nicholas found that he couldn't see where he was going. He checked his phone. No coverage where he went. And that man was lost. Now, he was smart enough that he dug himself a snow cave, and he spent the whole night shivering and feared for his life all night long. And in the morning, when he got up, he knew that his time was limited. And he went out trying to solve his problem of lostness. And the only reason why Nicholas is with us today is because he bumped into some skiers who were going by. And man, was that good news. And because they had a satellite phone, this guy got, this guy got a helicopter to where he needed to be. And he's recovering now. And, and his problem of lostness was solved, not because he's so smart, not because he's so great. His, his problem was solved because he bumped into somebody who could give him a helping hand. And, and that story of Nicholas is a story that applies to us. You see, in our lostness, we don't solve this by ourselves. We need somebody to solve it for us. This is what Jesus said. I, I'm in the business of solving that. And he said, my task is this. I have come to seek and to save the lost. We see him seeking people from Luke chapter 4 through verse 21. And as he's with the lost, you hear what people say. Hey, Jesus, you shouldn't spend time with those people. They are like, really lost, Jesus. Don't you know that? And Jesus is like, That's why I'm with them, because this is what I do. I seek the lost. And after spending those chapters seeking the lost, then he saves them as he goes to the cross, as he sheds his blood, as he pays the price that only he could pay so that the lost don't stay lost, but the lost are saved. So here's the big idea of Luke. Everybody's lost. And everybody can be saved. And there's one way that that happens. It's for people to lean on Jesus. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Now when we think about just these terms and what we've heard, I I think that we can start feeling that muscle of thankfulness and appreciation begin to flex, can't we? Because we have a God who's decided that he will reveal to us the unknowable so that we can... We can know his truth and his mind. Thank you for that. He chose a guy by the name of Luke who said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buckle down and I'm going to make sure that I give you the truth, not the narrative. And he wrote all of that so that we would, would understand. And he sent Jesus so we wouldn't be lost, so that we'd be saved. And Jesus gave his all for us with a reckless love. My goodness, he gave his all. And that's what Jesus did. And Luke said, I wrote all of this for this reason, so that you would have certainty. You get the feel for it? Obviously, Luke had certainty. It was clear to him. And he wanted you to have certainty. He wants me to have certainty, and I love certainty. And here's the certainty that I found. I found that everybody puts their faith in something, and lost people tend to put their faith in themselves and what they do and their good works in their religious system and how brilliant they are. And Luke kind of shakes his head and he goes, there's nobody who's going to be saved by that. But if you take your faith that you put in something else, and when you bump into Jesus and you see that he gave his life for you, if you take your faith and if you put it in him and what he did for you, at that moment you are found, you enter into the kingdom of God, you're part of his family, and everything changes. And Luke says, I want you to know for certainty where you are in this whole thing. If you want to be found, hang on to Jesus. He's the way. And I thank the Lord for Luke, and he will guide us in the next few weeks. Father God, we thank you for so many things. We thank you that you would choose to reveal to us what we could not understand on our own. We thank you for your revelation. And we thank you for people like Luke who would do research and present an orderly account so that we would have certainty 
And we ask that you give us certainty. We don't want fog on this topic. Are we lost or are we saved? And Jesus, we thank you that you offer us salvation, and we thank you that you receive our faith as we place it in you. Thank you for the gospel of Luke and what lies ahead. Jesus, we look forward to knowing you better through your revelation, through the quill of Luke. Amen.